Okay, shall we go ahead and kick off? Um, I will just give a, a brief overview on where the uh, mechanics of the program sit right now. And then I was going to hand it off to Taylor uh, Wagoner for two minutes who had a, um, a question specifically for Aaron about a uh, submission that he just made. So um, I'm pleased to report that we are up to 84 certified vendors, which is uh, an all time high and uh, kind of a spectacular accomplishment uh, and 103 certified products. Um, I'm just pasting in the, uh, the spreadsheet most people should be familiar with. Um, and we just had a kind pass a few hours ago as the first uh, 1.14 certification. So um, very nice to see that moving. Also uh, along the way, we uh, reached out to, I think almost over half a dozen uh, organizations who were going to have their certifications expire um, in, uh, today, essentially, uh, if they did not get an older one uh, certified. And only two of them um, fell out of certification, which uh, Taylor, I believe that was INSPUR, and who was the other one? It was Hesera and INSPUR, and there were 17 that were going to be uncertified, and 15 of them recertified, so that was great. Yeah, that's, uh, that's 15 is, I mean, huge. So congratulations on that. And it, I, I would say that it, it really dem demonstrates a key aspect of the certification program that we designed and, and hoped would work with that way, uh, which is that folks feel the pressure not to have their certification fall off and so to keep uh, certifying new versions. And the, the Hasura, I believe, has taken a different direction in terms of the product they're going forward with. Inspur uh, was just an oversight, and, and I do expect them to certify again and get back onto the release train. Um, so from the kind of program management standpoint, I, I think we're, we remain pretty thrilled with, uh, with where things stand. Um, yeah, and you can see the numbers there that were 47, 1.13, 54, 1.12, 62, 1.11 certifications are all uh, really fantastic. So um, if there's not any questions about um, that overview, uh, I would ask Taylor to ask that question for Aaron and the group. Sure. Um, Aaron, I noticed that you submitted the PR for Cube Up for 1.14, and there was a new to me uh, file in there for buildlog.txt. And I was curious if that should be in there or not. Uh, oh, good catch. It shouldn't be. I will remove it. Um, that was part of the pre-processing step that's called out in the readme, okay. where I type everything into build log and then I convert it to make it sound, uh, to make it look like Sonic voice log. Okay, great. Because I get some of these um, extra files every once in a while when people submit PRs. So I would like to check uh, thank you for that. I will take care of that right now. Great, and then I will certify you. Thank you. Thanks. This is Mehmet from Verizon. Just as a simple question, I'm not familiar with the program. Is there a, uh, are there some test cases documented that you use during the certification? Yes, so all of the conformance tests are the test cases that we use. And one of the common ways that people will do this is by using a tool called Sonaboy, which is uh, Heptonware's, uh, VMware's uh, tool. Um, but it's a list of test cases that are maintained by the upstream Kubernetes project. And uh, directions for how to do this should be in the CNCF Kate's conformant GitHub repo. Can you post a link if you can on the chat box? Maybe I take it from there. Yep. Thank you. Give me a second. Yep. I did. Okay, so um, next uh, agenda item, I think, was going to be uh, AI review. Aaron? Right. So first AI, I actually don't understand what this AI is. Des de description field for conformance docs, question mark? Uh, this is Chris. I was taking notes for uh, last conformance meeting. 
and we had talked about uh, generating um, a description field uh, within the conformance docs. I asked a question around, um, uh, where was it? It's the next question. Um, what's the command to generate the conformance docs? Um, let's kind of combine together how can we can automate the process for what fields are available and what changes between releases to have it. I'm going to put that question over to Srinivas. Yeah, basically, uh, description field is manually uh, pop populated right now, and um, it kind of describes uh, what the test is going to do step by step so that if there is any issue with, uh, with the test, so people will be able to, uh, without uh, looking at the code, be able to identify what uh, the description means. Um, um, we, yeah, we, we need to review that more clearly. Some of the description fields are not very descriptive. If that's what we discussed last time, I don't really remember. So to, to Hippie's question specifically about like, how do I generate the docs myself? Do, do you have right. a command? You can yeah, I did paste that in the Slack channel, uh, the command itself. Um, it's, it's essentially we are using the, the walker.go uh, from the conformance uh, subtree um, and uh, have a minus minus conformance on it. And probably if we want to add more functionality to that, uh, we could start doing subcommands on them rather than having flags. So there's a yeah. thought. So. Uh, Srini's also got a cap out about uh, trying to auto-generate conformance docs as part of the Kubernetes release process so that like the conformance doc, the, the documentation that describes all of the conformance tests and what they are and what they do is uh, distributed as part of the Kubernetes release. That seems to make more sense to me. I don't think it got implementable in time for Kubernetes 1.14. Uh, so if there are folks who are interested in working on that walker.go tool, because I think we've talked about that as a place to do not just like generating docs, but also maybe linting Kubernetes tests and whatnot. Uh, we would love to see some attention and movement on that cap. That would be awesome. Yeah. I think that's it for that action item, unless you had any more questions, Hippie. No, that's it. The next item on the agenda was there were some um, some more data uh, details needs to be added to the description field um, for uh, tests that are tagged Linux only. Uh, I assume the Linux only test can be promoted to conformance. Then in that case, uh, we need to uh, identify why Linux only uh, tag is added and added that this, uh, that details to the description field so that um, when Windows uh, tests are returned, uh, we should know uh, what the difference is going to be. So uh, as today, the hours, we, we identified one of the tests where uh, it's basically a mount issue that one of the tests are tagged as Linux only. So. So did we want, we talked yesterday about this, putting those uh, in there, and um, we wanted to link to the cap. Are all of the reasons captured in the cap already? Is there a section or something we can link to? Yeah. Yeah, so most of those are in the cap, and we also included them in the docs. Um, right now, we actually have uh, two separate PRs open that are working to get this um, we're ba based on the feedback uh, from the working session yesterday, we're trying to get um, a brief, like a condensed version of that in the conformance, um, or sorry, in the, in the contributor documentation for conformance tests to give people an idea of what to look for in terms of handling multi-arc tests. And then that has a link to the full list as well. Um, so I'm, I'll work to get these two PRs rationalized because there's a, bit of a confusion across time zones. I submitted one and then someone in Europe submitted one. Um, so we'll get those uh, worked out and that's gonna be the, the start of that list um, in terms of the, the capabilities that are there. Um, I think the, the other question I had for here was whether, whether or not we wanted to 
include details in those test cases as part of code comments or whether it needed to be part of the test case description. Um, I don't know if there was something um, decided yesterday or if that was going to be deferred to this meeting. So if we are generating, I'll take that question for a second. Um, if you are generating the documentation, um, usually the tool will read anything that is part of the description field and the comments that are added at the top of the okay. function. So um, it can be a comment or part of the description field. Um, I would, well, so I think what we walked away with yesterday was saying um, it should be part of the description. Uh, it was okay. unclear to me whether the conformance walker parses out that entire block comment. I thought it looked specifically for some fields and then pulled the values from those fields in the comment. And it might be worth considering if we want another field for like Linux only or something to describe why this particular thing. Uh, but I feel like yesterday we said description. The other thing I'll suggest, but I, I leave it up to y'all to figure out how you best want to accomplish this is so the cap has like one massive section, I think it's like things that don't work now or will never work pending updates to Windows. And I feel like the discussion yesterday was around trying to cluster together groups of common reasons that large swaths of conformance tests were marked Linux only. Uh, so one of the examples was like Windows today does not support mounting a single file as a volume. And so it'd be cool if we had a single thing to link to for that particular problem, as opposed to linking to here are all the reasons that Windows doesn't work for stuff. Uh, and whether those are like, you know, if you create headers in a markdown file, you can link directly to those headers. Whether you want to try maybe pulling out some of these known issues into GitHub issues, so you can link to the known GitHub issue the same way we'll do sometimes if we drop to do comments and code and we're like, this is super weird because link to GitHub issue. Uh, but I feel like just linking directly to the cap as is today will not be granular enough for what we were hoping to accomplish. Okay, so the PRs I mentioned that I've listed here are basically for the documentation. I don't think that's the right place for the exhaustive list. Um, I think the takeaway here is that it sounds like we do want to update those descriptions and include the specific links in the test case. Um, where it's relevant. Is that what you're saying? That, that, that would be my advice. Okay. Um, any, anybody else from who was present at yesterday's more tactical meeting want to weigh in? Yeah, no, I, I agree. We should link to a specific header or line item that, that explains why that particular uh, test is Linux only. Okay. Yeah, I agree as well. Okay. Um, yeah, so we, we, we can do that. Um, I guess the, the thing I'd love that would be most helpful to me is if we're going to put things up in the description field, I need that information on how to generate the doc just so we can make sure that it is something that's going to be visible there. Um, so that way someone that's not delving into the source code can find what's Linux only and what the reason is. Um, so if you could share that with me and then um, we'll see about getting some updates done. And that's going to be in addition to the PR I already linked there, which was more review guidance. If that's all for the, the last um, uh, action item, uh, we had just one last thing was uh, where, where are we on the um, automation for the board? I know we've done a lot of manual curation and opening up to the communities uh, worked really well, um, but just, I wasn't quite sure on who was focusing on the automation and, um, and uh, I think there was in addition to automation querying to populate the board. I would posit that automation of the board is not necessarily this group's concern. This group wants to use the board and it's up to them to draft the policies. Uh, there's a contributor out there somewhere who's working on maybe a Prowl plugin uh, by way of Kubernetes testing to like 
automatically populate a project board with a given GitHub issue query, uh, but I don't have status on that. And then in addition, C contributor experience has a number of umbrella issues around how to better automate project management as does SIG PM. I feel like ongoing work on that stuff is out of the scope of this group. Fair, thanks for that. I do think it would be super cool if there was somebody who was responsible for grooming the board. And it is unclear to me if that person is Timothy St. Clair since he helped kind of bootstrap and organize the more tactical meeting that is held uh, uh, under, uh, under SIG architecture as a sub project or if it's Srinivas, since he said he was going to sort of take over like shepherding and whatnot in this group, it is very much not myself. I just try to actively move cards around on the board when I use it, uh, but I don't know who's like the owner of it, if anybody. Yeah, I'm, I'll manage the board uh, as much as um, I, I'm trying to learn right now, but yeah, I will do that. Um, okay, I can help out with that too. Very useful for, for identifying what what issues and then we we'll take our and we review them. So that's one source of truth, I guess. So. Oh, right. The prioritization would be important there too, Shingras. Okay. Um, we can move to open discussions. John has a document, John. Yeah, so this is a document I put together a while back, um, just describing a change to the way we track the um, the way we track the behaviors versus the tests. Right now, we put it all in the tests and in these annotations and the comments, and we sort of abstract out or we, we process it and get all that document out. And part of I think what we need to be able to do is. The, the people reviewing the behaviors, like this is how Kubernetes should behave and what's considered a piece of conformance, aren't, aren't necessarily the same people who, or they don't need to be the people who review whether a given test actually validates that behavior. And I think it's a, it's a lot easier to, to review the behaviors um, than go through all the test code to identify whether that behavior is, is, is tested properly. So what I was suggesting in here, and um, in the document, I linked to it. Um, people, please go ahead and comment. All I'm, all I'm asking about here in this meeting is um, for people to take a look and whether people think it has, the general approach has enough um, legs to, to move it to a cap. Um, basically, it's create a machine readable file that defines all the behaviors or maybe a collection of files. And, um, and then the tests have to essentially link back to an ID that's in that that's in that file, and um, that file then can be independently reviewed um, by people who don't necessarily want to read all the test code. So I was going through that, John. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I what I'm worried about in this one is uh, the implementation side whether we will get enough people uh, how do we incentivize people to help with this thing um, you know how do we populate the thing and yeah. how do we make sure that it is complete and uh, you know right. i know that when we uh, when we get people to write a cap we can propose uh, you know some sections there to get them to fill that stuff uh, how do we backfill it right now since uh, you know uh, essentially, uh, we'll have to. Yeah, well, it's kind of the same problem we have already backfilling, you know, the promoting conformance tests is essentially backfilling um, behaviors right now based on end to end tests. And right. um, yeah, I, I agree. And, and um, so I guess what I would propose right now is, is we move it forward in a KEP form and then. Um, we can try and line up. I can try and line up some resources here, and and you know, it, it all comes down to the approvers of the conformance suite would decide whether that, you know, whether the behaviors listed there are complete or or that sort of thing. I mean, um, I guess those problems are are inherent to this effort, whether we do it behavior first or test first, um, and uh, so I think. 
Right. Uh, so, just a, you said machine readable in there somewhere, right, John? Yes. So mm -hmm. then the question is, uh, will we be able to generate the tests from the machine readable form? Will that help incentivize to do people to do this? You wouldn't be able to generate the test because the, the, the machine readable form is really more around what is the, the it's, it's around the document we're going to produce that we produce today by, by reading the, the logs and the test files. Um, and it's about the, um, the, what am I trying to say? It's about the, the, the ties back to, uh, it's about the human, human understandable description of the behavior and then having a, a hook for that to be tied into uh, on the test side. So tests still have to be written by hand. Um, and then somebody has to validate this test actually does test this behavior or this, this set of behaviors. Um, and and that's, that's part of the review process. It's just separating out. Right now, if you go and review a conformance test, you're reviewing two things. You're reviewing, does this behavior, is, should it be part of conformance? And two, does this test validate that behavior? So I'm just trying to separate those things out into two different reviews because I think it's two different, it can be two different people that, that makes those decisions. Today we're writing code and then writing design docs after we write code and convincing ourselves that that's the right design because the code says that. I think this is suggesting start with the design doc and then make the code match that approach. It, it, and that, that's an analogy, yeah. I mean, we're, we're, we are talking about behaviors that are already documented in the API documentation or somewhere in Kubernetes.io somewhere. Right, so that then we're trying to take those behaviors and make them very explicit and clear, at least the ones that are part of conformance. Oh, right. So uh, definitely, if there are people who are willing to sign up to do this work uh, to produce the initial set that can then be reviewed, uh, I think that will be really helpful because the people who are going to do the review will not be, you know, able to have yes, absolutely time yeah. to do that. And I pasted uh, one more link called Gabby. Uh, this is something that we use on the OpenStack side uh, for uh, it has a machine readable form and then it basically it doesn't generate code but it runs uh, uh, you know HTTP uh, resources uh, based tests testing uh, so that 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 was what came to my mind when you were talking about this and I think Quinton has his hand up Quinton Oh yeah, I just I just wanted to add. So I've I've gone through John's document. And I think it's great. I think I think this is like one of the single most important things that we have to do uh, is is actually defining what what is and what is not. And I think we're very far away from it today. Um, I think what's in the doc is is a great start. Uh, I share Dims's concern. Uh, I actually have a greater concern. So, so backfilling stuff is actually, you know, a reasonably tractable problem if we decide it's the right thing to do. I think the bigger problem is actually making sure that this stuff stays up to date over time. Um, because as soon as we have, you know, tests and code and descriptions of what the code is supposed to do and what the tests are supposed to do, we have these three things that can very easily get out of sync. Um, and, and no, as far as I can determine, no reliable way to actually ensure that they stay in sync. Um, so I'm just kind of uh, thinking out loud here. Another approach is to actually have a reference implementation and say, this reference implementation is by definition what is Kubernetes. And if, you, if your system behaves exactly like this reference implementation, then it is conformant. And if it doesn't, then it is not conformant. Uh, and then we potentially, and we have to decide whether the tests or the descriptions are, or the implementation are the actual canonical definition of what this stuff is. Because right now the tests are not, the implementation is not, and these feature, uh, the, these uh, behavior descriptions are kind of destined never to be because we can't keep them in sync with the tests and the implementations. <laughs> So I'll right. start talking about, but I think that's a. I think before we get too worried about how we're going to backfill things and all this kind of stuff, I think this problem we have to solve first. And, so, and Quentin, the problem there is how do we 
give the ability to someone who has no idea what tests need to be run or if what conformance means uh, the tools to compare their implementation versus the uh, reference implementation right that's what we have right now with sonoboy uh, hiding the end to end tests so that's going to be the larger problem there yeah yeah no i understand that but i mean the reality is that you know a very small fraction of our of our end to end tests around 10% are actually kind of defined to be conformance tests. And as a result, I would guess that, that it would be completely impossible to write an application that runs on something which is only conformant because there's just not enough stuff in the conformance tests to actually be able to do that. So until we get to a point where we have some way of verifying that something that, that you know, I can write an application that I know will run on all conformant clusters, um, we kind of haven't really got to our end goal. And well, we've gone round and round on this in the past. Uh, also in the context of like the LTS discussion, the idea that maybe it doesn't make sense to try and uh, focus, rally around the Kubernetes until we've actually got everything to GA that is usable and acceptable. Notably, this comes up in the context of storage uh, many hundreds, if not thousands, of those end-to-end -to -end tests you see skipped are different variants of storage tests run for all of the each of the different CSI plugins. Um, and it's not our job to verify that Kubernetes is conformant for literally every possible CSI and CNI and CRI plugin that you can hook into a Kubernetes, but to make sure that whichever one of those you have plugged into your Kubernetes, it works as expected. And because we say that conformance tests can like have to rely on default behavior, like any of those CSI plugins, you can't guarantee, like you can't guarantee a consistent, common, persistent storage implementation across all versions of Kubernetes. Uh, and I, so that's like one great example of how like applications usually need to persist state in one form or another and conformance tests can't cover that because there's no out of the box consistent way of persisting state. Like we well, might have that with 114 because of persistent local volumes, but I'm not sure if any of those things are actually GA yet. So, so Aaron, the, the CSI, CNI, those are pluggable aspects. So we need to have a clear, I mean, CSI forms a clear contract, right? Between the Kubernetes infrastructure and the backend. So in theory, uh, as long as we, have tests that exercise all of those things. We, you know, it's, it's up to the distribution seeking uh, conformance to configure their particular cluster with the, the CSI plugins that they want to use and, and, and validate the conformance there, as so opposed that, to us validating conformance of every different CSI driver. That's correct. It just gets up to, into that like weird corner case of, our, uh, uh, God, I really don't want to talk about profiles right now, but like, Kubernetes can run on Raspberry Pis and it can also run on 5,000 node clusters that have like very specialized storage plugins for them. So are we saying like in order to be a Kubernetes, you have to have some kind of CSI plugin hooked up or are we saying it's acceptable to be a Kubernetes without a CSI plugin? So it's, yeah, it's actually think... worse than that because all of the network attached storage providers have different, their volume sources have different uh, parameters exposed to the user. So you need an abstraction over that, which is some sort of storage class thing, and then to find some kind of common behaviors that you would expect across different volume sources. So I don't actually want to rat hole on that specific issue right now. It's a hard problem and the storage folks have been looking at it, but I actually think that particular thing is much lower in priority than covering the basic things that everybody uses. And yes, that's not sufficient for anything, but if we don't have coverage of even that, then nothing else really matters in my opinion. Right, so here, uh, I think John is asking, should he do a cap? And I would say yes, uh, I think we should explore this more. Okay. Well, so I made a comment in the chat, um, which I guess is sort of related to some of the other comments that were made, but it's more than just the behavior, if you're, you're putting a tag on some test saying, 
it tests this behavior. It's really hard to know what that means without going to review the test because you don't know if it adequately exercises that behavior and tests the corner cases that need to be tested. Uh, you don't know whether it tests those behaviors using acceptable mechanisms for, from the perspective of conformance. You don't know whether the test is gonna be adequately forward compatible, which is another requirement. So right now it's pretty hard to review conformance tests. We're not really at the point where you can turn a crank and say, I know how to create a conformance test that's gonna be sufficient and acceptable. Um, that's really tricky. Uh, so I'm never gonna trust a tag that someone puts on a test. I'm gonna go review the test. Right. So I, yeah, I guess my, what it sounds like you're saying is that you're, you're, you're not necessarily in agreement that the people reviewing the behaviors that, that we can sec that we can segregate segregate the people viewing the reviewing the behaviors this is what should be conformant versus the people reviewing this test but basically there's your first sentence and all the rest and i'm thinking that those could be different that the people reviewing that the test actually validates the behavior it doesn't have to be the same person whether there's value in that it sounds like you're challenging that assumption i think we're not there yet like theoretically, that would be true that you could just have someone get a test to the last point where it needs to be approved. And we've been trying to move in this direction and say, look, is this a valid behavior to test in conformance or not? Like we have tests that cover it totally adequately and properly and whatever. Uh, and we just want to know, should we officially add this to the conformance suite? That would be beautiful and wonderful. Um, it seems like we're far from that. Okay, well, I'll, I'll still move forward with the cap and we can just keep discussing it, trying to move forward, see what we all think. Right, anything that gives us enough information to say this is what is missing, uh, so we can go do something about it is helpful, I think, John. Yeah, I mean, certainly I'm in favor of trying to come up with a list of behaviors that we should test. Like that seems like a valuable exercise. And in some cases, I don't even think it's rocket science, like just go read through the pod spec and cross out everything that's not optional or non-portable. Right. And I, I mean, in the in the, the sort of document I put together that was just a, I mean, I just spent like an hour looking through the pods, like maybe not even an hour, just wrote out 50 or 60 things, I think, you know, it, it's like you said, not, it's, it's not difficult. It just takes time. Yeah. Yeah. For what it's worth, I, I have been talking with John about this approach off and on in the past, and I'm in favor of it because like, I just desperately don't want us to fall back to using a spreadsheet. I feel like that's kind of where this whole effort started way back in the day. And so instead of using a spreadsheet, if we use YAML, like, that's fine. Because I just want us to get to the point where we enumerate the list of behaviors, and then we sort of map out the state space, and then we start to cross those behaviors out as we implement them. And so I think this is a great way of parallelizing. Let's approve the dump truck of work and then we can have other people work on the dump trunk of work. Okay. And, and yeah, like we definitely have to make sure they implement the dump trunk of work in the right way, but I think this will help us scale. Oh, right, plus it'll help us prioritize too, saying do these things first and the rest later. Okay, well, <laughs> that's it for that topic then, we can move on. Thank you. So next topic is Brian on uh, coverage of HCD dependent API server behaviors. Yeah, so this is one of these basic things that I've been talking about. I, we have been focused on moving node conformance tests into conformance to get better pod coverage. That's one of the basic primitives of Kubernetes. The other is the uh, API surface of the API server somewhat generically, and there have been some uh, proposals or attempts to create some sort of automated tests of API endpoints and whatnot, but I actually think that the tests that have been written in that does area has not been super useful. What would be super useful is more rigorous testing of the behaviors that we inherit from etcd, because originally we had in mind a certain model for interaction with the API server, but um, you know, out of expedience we kind of just lifted behaviors almost whole cloth directly from etcd. 
And we have more and more projects that are swapping out at CE. There's the Cosmos DB uh, implementation. There's um, K3S using SQLite is one of the most recent that I'm aware of. So there are a bunch of examples of this. Um, almost the API, SIG API machinery had been working on adding a few more tests around watch behavior. Specifically, I don't know what the current status was the last time I saw it. It wasn't super rigorous. Uh, just tested that, yeah, if you create an object, if you update an object, if you delete an object, you get watch events. That's not remotely adequate um, for, for making sure that the behavior of controllers will be what people expect. Um, you know, you need to test things like breaking the watch connection and being able to reconnect and reestablish watch. Um, there are consistency model issues that we haven't even really decided what um, what behavior we want to officially support and clients are building assumptions around accidental behaviors like the resource versions are technically officially supposed to be opaque but we don't obfuscate them so people are doing comparisons on them in ways that we don't really recommend, but we don't strongly enough discourage. Um, so there are a bunch of issues like that uh, that need to be sorted out. And part of it is writing tests and part of it is actually writing, deciding what, for example, our um, consistency model is. If I write two objects, do I see the uh, watch results in any particular order of those two things? Stuff like that. So we actually need to decide what behaviors we officially guarantee and which ones we don't and write some kind of spec uh, for that and test the spec. And maybe also think about you know, ways we could um, force clients to uh, adhere to the spec and not depend on things that are not in the spec. Yeah, we could have tests that, that if, if say we don't, if say we, we allow out of order watch events, then we can have tests that actually intentionally do that, right, and, and make sure clients work properly? Well, probably we would have to make changes to Kubernetes to make it actually deliver things in the wrong order. <laughs> right. Or in a different order. Yeah. So, pretty lame question, but uh, I'm assuming that the functionality is not fully tested, so we are, we are, we are, we, sh we are supposed to write more ETA tests um, to test all the behaviors, uh, or we just start with the spec and then from there we go and write the ETA tests and then promote them? Uh, you are correct that we don't have enough tests. I, I think the tricky thing here is that people we've asked to go write tests aren't sure what they should test. Um, so yeah, we need to hash that out. Sounds good. Actually, um, we uh, I'm working with the Globin team, and we are interested in writing new tests, but we don't know the direction. So that's one blocker for us. For this topic specifically, you mean, or more generally? This topic specifically, because so far it's we're finding ETA tests that we can promote, but um, etcd was one of the top priorities that in from the umbrella items that I logged in for the conformance and um, we don't have a, a clear direction how to pr progress so. yeah we need to discuss with sig API machinery about what behaviors we think need what behaviors we officially want to support and which ones need better testing my suggestion for Globant would be to deprioritize etcd related behaviors and focus exclusively on pod related behaviors. I just feel like the etcd stuff is going to be significantly more subtle and does need the involvement of SIG API machinery folks. Pod not so much. So I think we probably need to start with, with um, working with API machinery folks to come up with some first cut of this is what the watch semantics, the consistency model, all of this is. And, and I mean, it's just gotta be done, right? Somebody has to sit down and, and, and write it. I can take a first cut at that and work with the, the team, uh, the API machinery team and um, SIG and try to get 
they're going to be the ones who know best. But I'll I'll uh, I'll get something started. Um, once we have something started, then we'll have something to debate over. Yeah, that would be great. On the pod topic, um, do we know where we are on the pod behaviors that are still not covered? Well, I think that's the hard thing since we don't have that list of other than the API documentation itself. Yeah, so we probably need somebody to do that as well, which is go yeah. through the pod spec and cross things out and decide what things need to be covered and then go figure out from the existing tests where we are on that. Sounds good. Yeah. yeah, it is important that we, if we have to write new ET tests, it has to be at the beginning of the release cycle. So can't really promote them. So. Yeah, another sort of pretty basic area that's related to pods, but uh, goes a little bit outside of that is networking. So basic pod networking. It's not clear to me that we have adequate coverage. Networking is another one of these things in Kubernetes that is super pluggable. There are lots of CNI implementations. Um, I don't think I, we have tests that ensure that you know, two, two pods on different nodes can talk to each other. Like, I don't even know if we have a test for that. Um, that would be useful to figure out. There are some tests uh, around that, but when I looked at them, I'm not sure that they actually do what, what we think because they all use host networking, which then has... Uh, yeah, so that doesn't count. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So they, theoretically, that's what they claim they test, but I don't think that's what they're testing. Yeah, so there are a bunch of different networking combinations. And yeah, I don't even know if we have the basic thing that two pods can talk to each other via their pod IPs. Um, but there are a bunch of other networking configurations that also probably we want to make sure are tested. Uh, so it would be useful to figure out in that area what we should be tested, what tests we have, what tests we need. Sounds good. Um, but again, then we need a bigger um, number of nodes in the cluster, like at least two. At least two. But we've already said that we're going to require at least two. So let's move on to the next item, which is uh, API snoop user agent filtering. Yep. This is Hippy. Um, <clears throat> one of the things we've been working on is um, adding the ability to filter by user agents so now that we have the user agents available. Um, I think this will help us to identify pieces of software that are used within a system um, and what endpoints they're hitting. Um, we have our initial uh, branch up. Um, Oh, there's a link there, but it's having some issues on some browsers. So I went ahead and pasted some pictures here. Um, you'll note that CSI, our storage interface, is hitting some, some beta endpoints, um, just so we can be aware of what, uh, what inter endpoints we're hitting. Um, the so search bar will allow you to do a regex for all of the different um, endpoints that are there. So we can possibly do things where we um, look at uh, pieces of software for um, different, we, we're calling them KPIX uh, at one point, but anything using the API so we can define and research new behaviors. Um, I think this might be useful in, in helping to address some of John's um, behavioral driven proposal stuff. I haven't had a chance to look through uh, the document yet, but part of um, the API snoop analysis is to help us um, automatically define some of those behaviors based on analyzing a lot of our community data. Um, uh, beyond doing the um, filtering to um, uh, user agent, we're also looking to filter on endpoints and um, we're trying to generate something where we have based on our um, code uh, ways to filter on what SIG um, is responsible for that endpoint possibly. So we can kind of bind together an, a particular application um, using the uh, um, API server 
with particular SIGs, um, and that kind of flows into um, Sri, Sri and I um, spent some time curating the board um, this week, and uh, we were thinking about ways to send out weekly targeted emails, which might combine um, a link to API Snoop with targeted uh, applications that are using um, their endpoints, uh, along with a link to the boards and issues um, to try to increase um, SIG engagement. Um, uh, these are some of the um, links to Node, Cluster, Lifecycle, and Windows that we um, were going to go through. But I think um, with that, I, now that I've kind of, uh, from the meeting yesterday, um, that's probably where we go through the board more. And this is more of a high level overview. But I just wanted to get some initial feedback on uh, how useful it is to filter by user agent and eventually by the, um, uh, the endpoints based on various metadata and also um, sending out uh, links to various SIGs um, and the related issues on the board. One of the ideas kind of laid out here in the picture is uh, focusing on all the CSI, all the storage, uh, storage uh, container storage interface as it interfaces to the cluster. Um, I can think of other ways where we can use that to focus on um, other components and the storage control or CRDs and whatnot. You know, one, one thing I wonder about um, one of the discussions that came up earlier was around, and we didn't want to rat hole on it, um, different areas of functionality within Kubernetes that um, that may we may want to have conforming behavior around, and that some clusters, for instance, might not. Uh, have some, may not, may have a, running on Raspberry Pi and doesn't have any kind of persistent volume functionality at all. Um, something like this could help us understand what can run on um, a given cluster when it only implements a subset of the functionality um, that, you, you know, that's, uh, so if, if it doesn't implement PVs, what what components of the system may or may not function, or even, you know, uh, so what third party tooling may or may not function if there's a way to, to kind of automate that? Because we can see what APIs it's calling, if it's calling APIs that aren't supported in some particular um, set of features, maybe there's a, a way to, to use this to flush out any um, dependencies. When I was more focused on the conformance effort, uh, back to my particular presentation for Shanghai, a couple ways that I found this user agent information useful was to be able to take a look at what endpoints are obviously exercised by a lot of tests and what endpoints are, are not. Um, to give me some context for, cool, we're touching this API endpoint, but only once. We're probably not hitting it with enough variation in parameters. That would be an area to investigate for coverage. Um, I also feel like the API coverage information it would be more useful if we could find a way to filter out discovery API accesses because today if you just take a look at API coverage due to conformance tests, you'll see there are a lot of alpha and beta endpoints that are hit and it's not, it's, it's not like the tests themselves are hitting those endpoints, it's that you know, cube CTL or, or sorry, cube client or something like hits the discovery endpoint and walks every endpoint available at first. If we could get rid of that, then we could start to really gate the like eh, eh, big red flashing light if, you know, something is not testing a stable endpoint, but something else. And I think that would be a really good sanity check for all this. Uh, filtering on test tags and stuff could be useful because um, like all of the different test case names are each their own user agent. And that was really helpful to me for drilling down and exploring this data. One of the things you're recommending there on being able to see um, what's hit 
a lot. Um, uh, is actually a ticket for implementation in the next uh, few weeks. Um, it's a flare. So as endpoints are hit more um, within a particular, like within, uh, it, it will be longer. So the ones that are really long uh, on the outer edge, um, I could drop a link to that, but that should help with easily identifying um, which tests are used a lot, uh, or which endpoints are used a lot but not tested, and which endpoints are used a lot that are tested but not conformant. Assuming we also filter out the, the endpoints you were speaking about um, that are incidentally hit uh, during the test suite. Um, yeah, we have six more minutes. Uh, let's move on quickly. Uh, I think uh, um, Chris um, briefly touched upon the curation of the board, um, project board. Uh, essentially what we are looking for is a pattern to identify uh, which six to, um, to engage and then also um, on a periodic basis we, we have to uh, we, we figured out there are lots of rotten issues that um, that are still part of the project board and there are um, those needs to be um, uh, manually uh, addressed. Um, that's all I want to bring up there. Chris, you have anything else on that item? No, a lot of what we just, um, what written there earlier was around automation and we're out of scope for that. So I removed those sections. Um, I think the last thing is making sure that um, uh, if William's here, we have a chance to just talk briefly about KubeCon Barcelona. Awesome. Hi, Ben. <clears throat> yeah, so I just wanted to go over what the options are for, for KubeCon Barcelona. We've been approved for a combined track, which is like the intro and the deep dive together. Um, so my plan was, uh, to present you know, just, just the intro deck that we have to anyone who's new there. And apparently there's a huge number of attendees at KubeCon, so I imagine there will be some new participants and people who are interested in certifying. So that, that should hope, hopefully be valuable content. Um, <clears throat> for this group, the, the real question I had uh, now is, is who's gonna be there? Um, what topics do you wanna discuss? And kind of is there enough, are there gonna be enough people there and enough topics that we can have like a valuable discussion in person? And, and what should that be about? So maybe, maybe we can start by just uh, by just polling like who who's going to be there of the people on this call now. I'll be there. Just, all right. I will anyway, be. There. I guess if everyone can just put their name in, in the doc, just so, <laughs> so I have a rough idea. I saw Phil's hand. <laughs> Phil's there. Okay. Oh. Test Google Docs the ability for like all of us to come and write in the same place. Right. So, in terms of topics, as people put their planned attendance there, and this does this, you know, you're not committing to it at this point. It's just who expects to be there. Um, what kind of topics should we should we bring up face to face? Do you think? Is, is there anything like I mean, so, ones that I found particularly useful, or like anything kind of thorny, or you know, um, yeah, any kind of design challenges? So I per yeah, I agree. I felt like the last working group session was good to get some consensus on topics we've discussed at length. Uh, I personally feel as though discussion around the concept of validation uh, would be helpful. Um, I think that we have some preparatory work to get us to there. Like there's a PR that I think Brad Topol or somebody started, uh, but I feel like we were talking about that as a way to kind of do maybe like node validation, or maybe we're talking about CSI validation and CNI validation and CRI validation to talk about those consistent set of behaviors across the different plugins that implement those things. Um, but I think we had talked about those is maybe a way of trading off the concept of profiles. 
And um, there seemed to be some consensus that validation sounded like a good concept, maybe a good way to rename what we now call the node E2E tests or the node conformance tests. But I feel like we haven't spent time flushing that out and getting to actionable steps. I have a comment on that. Uh, actually, yeah, but, uh, I'm working on some ETE tests for storage and uh, it's easy for me to put them into validation suite first and then promote them to conformance if they, if they, they fit there. So um, that way I can progress. So yeah, that's a, that's a good, good one to discuss. Okay. So can we, I mean, would, would you be interested in, in presenting just like a, a short, like, deck like you know three four slides just to kind of kick off the conversation absolutely me or Aaron yeah yeah me. that was uh, uh, Aaron? I, yeah not not me I, I'd rather okay, not get involved sure. in this <laughs> okay. I think that absolutely. sounds great I you, know, you I just think it. it's a good you just think it's a good topic okay so uh -huh. yeah. I think it's a good topic yeah okay um any, anything else that kind of like raise this level of like a good a good technical discussion that that would be valuable to, to do in person I think Quentin's suggestion of what defines useful conformance and how do we get there might be good. Could be a good time to just sort of review where we're at in implementing John's proposal, do the set of behaviors there, look meaningful when it comes to the types of applications that and that, that enables us to run. Okay. My AirPods are literally dying right now, so it's probably okay. it for me. Thanks. And we're at time, so. Um, any other ideas? People just um, just add them to the notes here. And we can we can take it offline as well. But that looks like a good starting point. Bye, everyone. Okay, thank you. Thanks Goodbye. for the call. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye.